Hi, my name is Thomas Fisher. Today is Saturday, October 12th, 2024. We're going to look at Matthew 24, verses 1 to 14. It is commonly known as eschatology, end times, discussion here, the Olivet Discourse. I'm not going to uh, be reading the whole chapter because it would make the video too long and is enough to chew on with these 14 verses. In fact, I'm going to use a couple of other verses, including... Uh, the last three verses of Matthew 23, because Matthew 23 is really ties in with Matthew 24. It's a continuation. In fact, you can go all the way back to Matthew 21, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. It, it appears all of that takes place in like two days. I don't know if I can concretely prove that, uh, but it does appear that way. And it's at the end of Jesus' ministry, not long before he's crucified. And so let me read this. There's, there's two views, a dispensationalist view and a preterist view. A dispensationalist view would be that some of this, what I'm going to read now, is future, meaning like as in now and times. But a preterist view is that it's all uh, back then leading up to AD 70. Now, when Jesus is saying these things and having a discussion with his disciples, it's AD 33, right at the end of his ministry. So the destruction of the temple in AD 70 is 37 years later. So there's a lot that happens between this time and the destruction of the temple. So let me read verses 1 and 2 and then stop and talk about that for a moment. And this is the King James. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the temple, the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> now, th this is clearly referring to the temple that's standing at that moment the second temple, and it's destroyed in AD 70. So there's, there's no dispensationalist that can, that can or will argue that this is a future temple. So what, what he just said is referring to that temple right there that's destroyed 37 years later. Okay, now, now let me read uh, verse 3, because this is like the sticking point where there's a lot of debate, where the disciples ask him, uh, some questions uh, and depending on how you look at it it's either two questions or three questions and uh, for argument's sake I'm going to I'm going to combine the second and third question into one question so I'm going to look at it as really two questions and it says here and he sat upon the Mount of Olives and the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world Okay, and so, so that's two or three questions, like I said, as, as depending on your perspective or how you want to read it. Uh, you can look at it either way, really. So the first question, though, is very clear. But the disciples tell us when shall these things be. It obviously is referring to what Jesus just said, that not one stone was going to be left on top of another, that that current temple was going to be thrown down. It refers to that temple and its destruction in AD 70. Not arguable. It's, it's clear. The second and third question, or one question more, depending on how you look at it, is where dispensationalists say it's future. And that's this. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay, now, the end of the world, that word world is translated incorrectly. The King James should have used the word age. Because the world, the word world is translated from the word aeon, which means age or specifically a Jewish age. So it's a time period. But people that don't look closely at the, the original meaning of the words will see that the word world and think the end of the world, meaning like now, like with, the, with all these billions of people, like is it going to end in fire? Like the word says, nuclear world, war, war, you know, all or most of us are dead. The second coming of Jesus Christ. This is the impression that people get. But if you use the word that should be used there, the end of the age, then you can you can make it clear to people that 
it's a it's a preterist view. And so let me prove that right now that it's a preterist view and, and show and show you why the disciples asked those two or three questions, the second or third question rather. Uh, and so again, let me read the second and third question after the first one. The first one was, tell us when shall these things be? All right, that's clear. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So it's, it's very easy to prove what the disciples are asking. If you go back to Matthew 23 at the end, Matthew 23, verses 37, 37 38, 39, Okay, in, in, in Matthew 23, Jesus is rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He does that over and over and over. Woe to you, woe to you. Exposing them, and exposing all the hypocrisy and all the wickedness of them. And then in, in verses 37, 38, 39, he says this. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your, your house is left unto you desolate. For I, say, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So let, let, me, just, let, let me just focus on that last uh thing he said, you will not see me henceforth till you say, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. So he, he's saying to the hypocrites, he's addressing the hypocrites, but the disciples are right there and they hear this. And so this is the reason why in Matthew 24, verse three, the disciples say, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Because he just said, you will not see me henceforth. So they surmise very easily that he's going somewhere. We're not going to see him. And so that's the reason for their question in Matthew 24. What, what shall be the sign of thy coming? So it's not a long distant future question. It's pertaining to what he just said in Matthew 23 at the end there. You see that? It's very easy to understand that. And also... And also, if you look in Matthew 23, verse 39, at the end of that chapter, it, some people will read that and say, you will not see me till you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And some people will say, because they're not just, they're just, they're not being diligent. They'll say, oh, that happened when Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, they were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's That's not what Jesus is saying in verse 39, because it's after that. It, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey is two chapters earlier, three in chapter in Matthew 21. It happens earlier. And then Jesus is saying this after he rode in on a donkey. So, He's, he's not referring back. It, so when he says in, in Matthew 23, you will not see me again, until he say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he's referring to the future. He, so so people that are saying, refer, it's, it makes no sense. It, it's, they're not being diligent. It, it's, they're, they're totally inaccurate on that. So what Jesus is saying, and, and it's also not, it, it's not, he's not painting a picture as dispensationalists do. He's not painting a picture of, the far future, like meaning now, where the the Israel are in their nation, and they're in their nation again, and the second coming of Jesus Christ is about to happen. He splits the heavens and he's returning, and the Jews who are about to be destroyed by everybody, they see him, and, they, and then at that moment they repent and say, "Oh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." And so Jesus, in a moment's time saves them they because they're repenting it, it, that's the picture that dispensationalists uh, paint and it's just so wrong it what jesus is saying here is when he's saying you will not see me henceforth is is because until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord he's saying that when you humble yourself he's speaking to the hypocrites he's saying when you humble yourself and acknowledge that i'm the messiah then I will reveal myself to you, and then you'll see me. You'll, you'll know me. You'll understand me. It's a spiritual thing. It's getting born again. That's what he's saying. It is not referring to a distant second coming. And so it's very clear 
why the disciples asked that in Matthew 24, verse 3, why they're asking that question, what's the sign of thy coming? And, uh, and so, and so, and then also Jesus goes on after verse 3, now from verse 4, from verse 4 to 14, he answers those, that, those questions, what's the sign of your coming in the end of the world, or more accurately, the end of the age? Uh, the, the Jewish people, the disciples at that time, had they, they're not thinking in the slightest bit the end of the world as in everybody dead and that's it. it they're not thinking this. They're, they're, their mind is totally fixated on when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel where you're going to stop the Roman rule and uh, life goes on. So they're thinking that time period that the Messiah had come. The Messiah came and they're thinking, okay, this is why they all thought he was going to just come as a warrior. And it's like, and it's like he does come as a warrior, but he comes as a warrior figuratively in, in AD 70, get, getting revenge on all these hypocrites that killed him and destroying the temple. Coming in the clouds is a figure. Coming, he's coming in the clouds. It's, a, it's figurative language that we can see in Isaiah. He's coming in clouds. It means it's he's coming to seek revenge against evil doers. Coming in the clouds. It's it's figurative in that sense, symbolic, and not uh, necessary. Not literally. We're we're seeing him now, and so that's that's the mindset of the disciples. And so Jesus answers that in verses four to fourteen. I'm going to read all these verses. So just. Bear with me here. It's long, but I'll get through it quickly. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall hate and betray, shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, so Jesus, in all those verses, Jesus is describing all that happens leading up to AD 70. But a dispensationalist puts all that in the future, most of it, if not all of it, in the future, meaning like as in now, perhaps, 2024 or beyond, sometime real, real close. It's AD, it's leading up to AD 70. Jesus is saying these things in AD 33. And so there's a lot that happens between AD 33 and AD 70. And all these things can be found as to have happened in that time period where the, God, where the disciples, the church is formed and they're out preaching the gospel and taking this to the nations. And, and, and then they're afflicted, they're persecuted. What, like for instance, one... Uh, one nation will rise against a nation, a kingdom against a kingdom. Depending on your perspective, you can look at it this way. The kingdom of this world rising against the kingdom of the kingdom of heaven being formed and being established on earth by the disciples in that time period between 33 and 70. And so the kingdom of the world rising against the kingdom of heaven. See, it's a different perspective. And, and, and I, I would say to you that you can see all these things happening in verses 4 to 14. You can see all these things happening also through the historian Josephus, where he'll describe these things uh, in great detail. And a dispensationalist would say, oh, boo, boo, hoo, boo, ha, boo, ha. You're using a historian to describe things that are scriptural here. And uh, But let me just point out that there's tremendous hypocrisy from a dispensationalist that makes that claim, because what a dispensationalist will do is that they will they will put all this to the end times and they'll say all the things that are occurring during this end times, it all matches these scriptures four to fourteen. So do you see the hypocrisy in that? They're claiming themselves that what's happening now fits in. 
So it's no different than me saying that you can look at Josephus, a historian, and say that it's fitting in with these scripture verses. See, no different. So you can't you can't reject a Josephus if you're going to claim yourself that the signs of the times right now, which are not scriptural, it's just you speculating that it all fits into these scripture verses. So it's so hypocritical. You can't do it. You either got to accept that Josephus says these things fit with those times or not use the signs of the times now to prove your point about all of it being now. That's very clear. If you don't understand it, just listen to it again, what I just said, and think about it. Uh, and so, so it all ends. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me read uh, again verse 14, because I can clearly use something that Paul said. And this is the last verse of what I'm going to say in this, this video. I said I'm going to read up to verse 14, including verse 14, and then make another video for the rest of the chapter. All right. And so, and, it's, and so Jesus says in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Paul says it in Colossians 1.23 that he preached this gospel to every creature under heaven. And he, and he says this right in like leading up almost 8070, not, not quite 8070. So he's saying this to the Colossians before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 8070. So he's saying that every creature under heaven in the known world at that time, he's talking about the known world, uh, the Roman Empire ruled the known world. And so Paul and the other disciples preached the gospel to everybody. And they're saying that, which, which confirms what Jesus said would happen in Matthew 24, 14. So it's all a preterist view. And, and so and, and you, you can't disprove that based on what I just showed in the scripture. I use scripture to show that, including what I said in the end of Matthew 23 to answer the, 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 the disciples' questions uh, that they had to Jesus in the beginning of this chapter. And so uh, it, listen, watch this again and look at it closely to see what I'm saying. If you didn't really follow it, I, I went fast because uh, I just want to keep the video shorter, you know, and it's, and it's very clear to me. So if something's really clear to me, I'm, I usually I have a tendency to run through it very quickly. And so I hope this helps. Check out the description box of this description section of this video for links. Thank you for everybody that supports this ministry. We're very grateful to you. We pray that God increases you, blesses you, and keeps you safe in these wicked times that we're living in right now. I don't deny Jesus Christ returning again uh, in an in a actual physical way. It seems likely that that would eventually happen, right? Because we, we know that there's a new Jerusalem, and it's just there's so much description uh, that could point to that. I don't I don't know when that is, but I don't deny it. Although a full preterist says that it's it's all symbolic and that everything's complete. It's actually if if you if you look at the full preterist view, well you know I'm not gonna get. It. I was in I was finishing the video. I'll talk about that in the next video. You know the implications of looking at a full preterist view. So anyway, thanks for watching. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.